Hi there. Welcome to Building Better Tests with Blackboard Item Analysis. For those of you who are here today, welcome. For those of you watching the archive, um, I hope you find something useful. My name is Stephanie Richter. I'm the Instructional Technologies Coordinator with the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. I, I tend to train quite a bit on both sides of the teaching avenue, both teaching pedagogy and instructional design, as well as incorporating technology and using a wide variety of technology, whether that's multimedia, uh, mobile devices, or Blackboard, which is what we're talking about today. My contact information is here on the slide, both through uh, our departmental website, my email, and my Twitter. I will put this slide up again at the end, so feel free to wait until then to get my contact information. For more information about Blackboard in general, particularly how we use Blackboard here at NIU, I would recommend this website here at the bottom, niu.edu slash Blackboard. That will take you to our Teaching with Blackboard page here. Um, particularly today, I'm going to be talking about a lot of tools related to assessment and the item analysis in particular. Information for all of those assessment tools would be under Assessing Learners here on the menu on our Teaching with Blackboard site. We have a variety of both text documentation, some step-by-step -step instructions, as well as quick guides that provide um, just one page of need-to-know information about the tool and some video tutorials on how to use these within Blackboard. To start with a few tools that are not the item analysis, I just wanted to highlight some new features in Blackboard that you may not be aware of that can help you with your assessment needs. One of those that uh, these are all actually, I should back up and say these are all brand new to NIU as of our upgrade that occurred in May. We upgraded to 9.1 Service Pack 11 in May 2013. So these are the, um, some of the new features for our faculty that you may not have seen before. The Retention Center tracks your students and their progress throughout the course. By default, it will track and flag four different types of, of behaviors or problems, if you will. Those are listed here across the top. Missed deadlines, if you've set deadlines on assignments or tests. They will track grade alerts, if their grade is below the, the class average by a certain amount. Activity alert will let you know if they have not been active in the course compared to their peers. And the access alert will alert you if they have not logged into your course in a while. And what this allows you to do is see those students who are the most at risk and then um, view why they're at risk, what factors have they triggered, as well as be able to easily notify them and maybe give them just a little nudge or a push. You can set up your own custom rules by customizing the page here. And it will also give you a summary at the bottom of your activity in the course uh, in terms of how often you've logged in, when you've graded assignments, um, or if you have not graded assignments, as well as your activity on the discussion forums. Basically just to give you a summary of how your activity in the course may be impacting your students as well. A second tool that I think has a lot of great uh, implications for assessment is the content editor. This tool is primarily designed so that you can post content or you can uh, converse on the discussion forums. That's where students certainly will see this the most. However, with the, the easy to use new um, formatting tools that are available with the content editor, I think students can do a lot more of designing content in Blackboard. So you can ask them to do more advanced types of writing on the discussion forum, including media or images. You can also incorporate uh, post-first discussions, which is a great new discussion tool that you haven't used before. Post-first discussions require that students first 
make a post <laughs> to the discussion forum before they can read the posts that their peers have made. This cuts down a little bit on the Me Too type of discussion board posts where a student can simply read everyone else's posts and summarize one based on what they've read, what the others have posted, rather than writing a, a fresh post themselves. So from an assessment perspective, I think you get a, a truer sense of the student's actual work using a post-first discussion. To jump back for a moment to the content editor, there is also a new math editor embedded within that content editor. So if you want students to, they could actually write and converse and discuss mathematical content easier than they could before. Uh, by clicking the, the button on the content editor to launch the math editor here, they get access to these sort of easy click, uh, click and type editors to create mathematical equations. I think this is a great benefit in math or science courses where it was difficult to create formulas and to um, and then type out maybe chemical symbols or reactions that now is about the, it, this is very similar to the editor you find in Microsoft Word in, in terms of how it works. Um, it can really open up more ways to how you assess your students for this sort of math content. And then this tool I think is probably my favorite from having talked to them in the past. The inline assignment grading now will, instead of in the past, students would upload their Word or PowerPoint document to an assignment and then you as the instructor or faculty member have to download those, open them in the appropriate program, make your comments in that program, and then attach the file back. Now, for these file types, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, PDF, or HTML, Blackboard works through an integration with a product called Crocodoc to convert those into a PDF that displays directly in the browser for you. So when you try to grade a student's paper that they've submitted, you can see the comments, or see their paper here to the left, and I have a second screenshot that will show you. Uh, you can do your grading to the right. There's even a, um, a button where you can open up a rubric if you've created a rubric in Blackboard. So you can use that rubric to uh, determine their grade or you can assign a grade manually. You can type general comments here under grade or feedback for the students. But then to the left, you have a whole toolbar of annotation tools that you can use to mark up the paper in the browser. So here I've added a, a comment to the right about a specific passage. I was able to use the, the draw tool to sort of circle <laughs> this larger section and then added a text, uh, text box to add text within the columns of the paper as opposed to the, con the comment that's outside of the column. So this inline assignment grading really makes the process of grading a text-based assignment much easier than it has been in the past. None of those had much to do with tests specifically, however. Uh, one enhancement that I think we glossed over quite a bit when we talked about the new features as part of the upgrade is uh, actually an enhancement to the fill-in-the-blank question type. In the past, fill-in-the-blanks would only accept exact matches. So what you typed was exactly what students had to type. Now there are other, uh, other options, including a pattern match that accepts regular expressions. Uh, I'm personally not terribly familiar with how regular expressions work, but essentially you're able to establish a pattern that all of the students' responses have to follow. So here the answer is Descartes, and by putting in some of these special characters, then Blackboard can interpret some misspellings or um, variations in spelling to still mark it as a correct answer, rather than typing out every different, every separate misspelling that you are interested in accepting for a correct answer. This one is not part of the item analysis specifically, although you can view item analysis for a fill-in-the-blank question. However, this is a way to improve your tests and make it easier for you to grade them. 
Finally, item analysis. Item analysis is another new feature that became available with the upgrade we made to Service Pack 11. One of the keys to remember with item analysis is that it's only available after students have taken your test. And that's because the item analysis is actually essentially a summary of the statistical analyses conducted on the student's results. So it's important to note that item analysis will not tell you if you have a good or a bad test. Blackboard can't analyze your test and give you that type of feedback. What it can do is analyze your student's results to determine if those questions were um, good or bad or fair or not, essentially based on how well students performed. Ultimately, the item analysis is just one more tool that you can use to make decisions about your tests and about the individual questions. It will let you decide with a little more analysis whether a question may have been misleading or may have been off topic um, or may have been simply marked wrong incorrectly when you set up the question. Let's take a look at what item analysis looks like. I will do a live demo, but First, let's look at some, some still shots and I can explain some of the features that are on part of the item analysis. So when you run the analysis, it's run for a particular assessment, a particular test or quiz, actually. Item analysis is not available for surveys, even though they are closely related, and that's because surveys don't have a correct answer. So you really can't do this type of analysis on a survey result. At the very top of your item analysis, you'll see a summary of the test, the number of points that were possible, the number of questions that were included on the test, how many attempts have been completed or are perhaps still in progress, and the average score and time that it took students to complete that test. Next to that, you'll find two summaries of the statistical analysis of discrimination and difficulty, and I'll go into what each of those are uh, in more detail. But here, just know that once Blackboard has calculated these, it will also then summarize, based on those results, how many questions met certain thresholds. Again, I'll, I'll clarify all of that during the demo. When you scroll down the item analysis, you'll actually see a list of all of the questions that were on the exam as well as what type of question that was, and then the statistical analysis next to that. You get a discrimination index, a difficulty rating. It will, again, show you how many submissions were graded for that particular question. This, I think, is particularly useful for random blocks. So if you have a random block of 50 questions and you have students randomly receive 25 of those 50, every student will get different questions. And here you can see how many students got each question. If you have a, if you don't use randomization like that, if every student gets every question, then the graded submissions would be the same unless someone skipped a question. Next to that, you get some, uh, a little more typical standard or statistics from your exam, the average score that students earned on that question the standard deviation of their scores, which will tell you a little bit about how spread out they were, as well as that standard error. So let me start by explaining that discrimination score. Discrimination really tries to answer the question, did the question reflect the ability levels of the students? You can also look at discrimination for uh, exams as a whole, but Blackboard looks at it question by question. And essentially, it's the correlation between the right and wrong scores on that question with the total exam scores. So it's looking to compare whether the students who did well on the exam also did well on that question. So for example, the, the table I have here shows eight students and their score on the exam and their answer to this particular question. So just in looking at this set of scores, we can see that, generally speaking, more students who did well got the question right than the students who did 
poorly on the exam. This would be a, a higher discrimination score and a positive correlation between doing well on the exam and getting the question correct. Whereas by contrast, in the second example, we have a flipped situation. So now the students who did well on the exam overall did poorly on this question. And the reason why it's important to be able to gauge this is because if the students who are generally uh, showing that they understand the material did not answer the question correctly, then that may be an indication to you that there was a problem with the question. It may be a misleading question, something that um, may seem, the answer may not be clear based on really understanding the content. It may be a question that was scored. So in actuality, the students who did well got the answer to the question correctly, but Blackboard scored it as wrong because the incorrect choice was marked in the, the test. Um, and it could be a question that uh, is just open for debate, in which case there really is nothing wrong with the question, and you wouldn't make any changes based on this discrimination. However, the discrimination index can point out questions that need a little more investigation. Discrimination as a score is measured as an index from negative 1 to 1, just like any correlation would be. So to the right, when you have scores that approach 1, that indicates a stronger discrimination, which means, again, that students who did well overall got the question correct, while the students who did poorly overall got the question wrong. You can really think of it as discriminating, as separating the students who understand the material from those who don't. So then a negative discrimination means that you have a, an opposite situation, that the students who did well overall did not get this question right, and the students who did poorly did get it correct. So there's something that may be an issue with the question. And then in the middle, around a zero, that means that there's really no discrimination, or that there's no calculable discrimination. So the students who did, students either all did well or poorly overall, or they did well or poorly on this question kind of equally. Uh, this tends to happen a lot with questions that are easier. So more students got it correct. If you have 95% of your students who get a question correct, then the discrimination score is isn't as um, valuable of a piece of information because there was such a low margin of students who got the question incorrect. So you tend to see a, a more central uh, discrimination in that case. In general, I would expect that your questions will probably fall somewhere between a 0 and maybe a 0.6 or 7. The goal is not to get to a 1. <laughs> I want to make sure that I cover that, that that's clear. The goal isn't for a really good question has a discrimination of one. I think ideally we want all students to do well. So a lot of our discriminations will be fairly low because the majority of students will do well. And that's our goal as educators. We want to make sure students, we aren't testing them to penalize them, we're testing them to give them the opportunity to show us that they've learned. And we want that learning, that's what we value. So a discrimination of 0 is fine. A discrimination of 0.1 or 0.2 is fine. Um, where I would worry is with negative discriminations. Again, anything from a negative 0.1 or so and lower merit looking at in more detail. Even you know very close to 0, if it's negative, I would still look at that question because it may be marked incorrectly, it may have been misleading or a victory. You need to throw the question out or change the correct answer and regrade the exam. So looking at this particular set of selections, there is one negative discrimination of a negative 0.08. Because that's fairly close to zero, it may or may not represent a problem. It's negative, but it really isn't you know, extremely negative. It's just, it's really more a zero, I would say, than it is negative. However, this question also has a difficulty of 
eighteen and a half percent. And that, that I think is where the question merits even further uh, examination. We'll look at that in a moment too. Whereas down below here you see questions that have a 0.56 or a 0.6. These are your stronger discriminators, ones that are actually helping helping students differentiate themselves, those who understand versus don't. And you'll notice as well that right now these are sorted in order by discrimination. That triangle up here, as well as the darker shading around discrimination, is pointing out to us that the list of questions is right now for discrimination. You can sort by any of the cotters, um, but discrimination is a, a good one to start with. So now with difficulty, and difficulty I think is a really easy measure, but it's presented in a confusing way. Essentially the difficulty is asking how challenging is this question, and, and the proportion of students who got a correct answer. So here are two different situations. Let's look at the left one first. On this question, four out of the eight students got it correct. So that's a 50% difficulty. On the other hand, here, six of eight students got it correct. So that's a 75% difficulty. The reason why I feel like difficulty is a little tricky is that a higher difficulty score is actually an easier question. So uh, the higher the difficulty, the more students got it correct. Um, it might have been easier <laughs> to look at the percent of students who got it wrong as the difficulty, but I think looking at the percent who got it correct is um, a more positive approach. But that means that, let me go back to the, um, the example of the difficulty scores. That means that these scores with difficulty, this 19%, 18.5%, is a very hard question. Now, when I say it's a hard question, that does not mean that it's hard from a content perspective. You may think it's actually a very easy question. However, this means that the students who took the exam found it to be challenging, or at least got it wrong, which would imply that it was challenging for them. This could mean that, again, there's something wrong with the question, that it was miscoded or misleading, particularly on a true-false, and maybe one of those where there is one small catch that the students all missed, and that's why they got it incorrect. It could mean that the question had a, a term that they were unfamiliar with, or maybe something that uh, represents, again, a debate in your field where some scholars feel one and some feel the other, and maybe you contradict the textbook and students didn't make that distinction. It could also simply mean that students are confused about this topic. So with a, a low difficulty score, meaning that it's a hard question, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to take any action for the exam. However, that might be a good opportunity for you to revisit that content um, just to clear up any uh, misunderstandings that students may have about those questions and about that content. So I'm going to go to the, at the moment, there'll be a bit of a transition here, while So bear with me for just a moment while I <laughs> adjust things back over. I'm going to share my desktop. And that should just take a moment to appear. All right, so would everyone give me a check mark or let me know in the text chat that you can see my screen now? Excellent, thank you. As I go through this, I will still monitor the text chat. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type those in while I'm, I'm going through this, this demo. I will try to keep my eye on any questions that come up. So the first question you probably have is how do you access this item analysis? Uh, because it's not 
a menu item anywhere. It's not like you can just go click on item analysis and then see all of those results. First, you need to have a test deployed. And in fact, you need that, as I said, to run the item analysis, you need the test deployed and you need it to have been taken. Uh, you can run an item analysis with as few as two students. It just isn't going to give you very powerful information at that level. So let me go into my course, into my assessments area. This is where I happen to have a test deployed. Excellent. So here, this Blackboard NG review, this happens to be, by the way, our Basics of Online Learning course, which we use for training about Blackboard. So you'll see everything is, is an example or is specifically related to Blackboard. So here's this quiz that we gave on some of the new and old features in Blackboard. And I want to see how did my workshop participants do overall. Um, if I click the drop down here, this action link it's called, in this menu of options along with edit the test, edit the test options, here at the next to last setting is item analysis. So I could click here and be taken to the item analysis page. I'll do that. But before I run this analysis, I want to show you a few other places where you can access this. You can also access the item analysis if you go in the control panel to course tools. And then in course tools, go to tests, surveys, and pools. This is your test manager. In fact, I'm going to then click on tests as well. Here, I have a list of all of the tests that are in my course, some of which are deployed, some of which we haven't deployed yet. But I can view them all in one place. I can also, here for this Blackboard NG review that's deployed, here I can click the action link, and go to item analysis, just like I did from the, the test where it was deployed. This gets me the exact same uh, report, actually. However, there is a third place you can go as well. When Blackboard put this together, they really tried to make it as convenient for you to access as possible by giving you as many uh, entry points as possible. So if I go back down to the Grade Center, let me go to the I'm going to go to the full grade center view so I can see all of the columns in my course. And this column here is the Blackboard NG review quiz with the, the numerical values in it with the scores. And I can see that some of my students have taken it, but they haven't all taken it. Normally, I might wait until everyone took the, the test to run the item analysis. However, by running it now, I get some information in case I need to make changes before the rest of the students take the test. So I'm going to go ahead and run it now. And from the Grade Center, again, if I click the action link for the column header, down in the, about the middle of the menu is item analysis. So there's the three different avenues you can take to get to the item analysis. Essentially, I use whichever one is most convenient for me at the time. Um, where do I happen to be in my course? Am I looking at the grades, and that's what made me think to go to the item analysis? Am I checking that the link is working so then I can get to the item analysis? Um, it all depends on, like I said, what the workflow is that you're currently on. Once you're at the item analysis page, you'll see initially that there are no analyses available. To run one, you would select the test from the drop-down menu here. I'm going to run Blackboard NG Review and click Run. It's not a terribly <laughs> difficult process. It can occasionally take a little bit of time for the analysis to actually run. If that's the case, leave. Um, and then come back. I also want to point out, you probably saw a pop up here in the corner. This is my email notification telling me that the item analysis ran successfully. So if you do need to, uh, if it's taking a while and you need to come back later, you will get an email when it's successfully completed. Fortunately, today it ran really quickly. Uh, with more students or with a larger test, it may take longer. 
Once you've run the analysis, you just click on the link. And notice it gives you the date and time when that analysis was run. So if I click here on Blackboard NG Review, this is my item analysis page. Pretty simple. It looks very similar to that screenshot. I'll scroll down a little bit. Here's my test summary. There were 100 points with 10 questions, 19 completed attempts, an average score of 58, 57.9. That doesn't look so good. That gives me a little bit of pause. That tells me that my students overall maybe struggled with some of these questions. However, they did take it really quickly <laughs> with an average time of one minute. If you hover over any of these boxes, you will see the pop-up that gives you more information about that, um, that particular item. So it will actually tell you how this is calculated or what, that, um, what it's referring to. Under discrimination, you'll notice that it's divided into four categories, good, fair, poor, and cannot calculate. For discrimination, if you have 100% of the students get a question correct, then Blackboard cannot calculate the discrimination. Uh, that's an unfortunate side effect of the way that it's calculating. Here, notice that for discrimination, while it, it does sort it into, um, into different categories, it does tell you what those cutoffs are. So a discrimination, a good question has a discrimination higher than 0.3, between 0.3 and 1. A fair is between 0.1 to 0.3. And a discrimination of poor would be less than 0.1. Now, these are just um, guidelines. They aren't set in stone. But these are uh, just some, some cutoffs for you to consider. The same thing for difficulty. An easy question has, means that more than 80% of students got it correct. A medium question means between 30 and 80 got it correct. And hard is more than 30% got it, or I'm sorry, fewer than 30% got it correct. So here I have one easy question, seven medium, and two hard. And I'll reiterate this point again, but I do feel that the best exams have a balance. And in fact, here they're, it's probably harder than it needed to be. So I'm going to look at some of my questions to see how this worked out. Bill, um, yes, I can see this other chat. It's just going to take me a moment to kind of go back and forth between my, my two panels. Um, So let me take a look at some of the questions you had come in. So will these grading tools work using a Mac? Yes, absolutely. All of these tools will, be, will work on a Mac. They are Mac compatible. Um, the discrimination and difficulty, as I said, are they're calculated by Blackboard according to the statistical results. It's just a, an analysis. And then they are um, implemented here based on those cutoffs of good, fair, and poor are according to those cutoffs. It's, I can give you a reference for it. It's a, basically a, a calculation based on what the student's score was and whether or not they got it correct. And you kind of add up all of those from all of the students. It's essentially a correlation. All right. I'll, I saw there's one other question from you, Will, or Bill. I'll get to that um, at the end of the, the workshop. OK, so also on this page, I want to point out that you can filter these questions based on the question type. If you have a, lot, a large number of questions for maybe a final exam that you offered online through Blackboard, you may not want to scroll through all of those questions um, at once. So you can actually sort based on, I only want to see the multiple choice questions or just the true-false questions or I only want to see those questions that had a good discrimination, or only those that had a poor discrimination. You can make those, make those judgments and filter accordingly so that you can narrow your focus just on the questions you want. 
As I pointed out on the screenshot, you can sort these by any of these column headers. So for example, I can sort by question alphabetically. I can sort by question type to get all of the multiple answer, choice, and true-false together. The default sort is discrimination. And that will sort from the lowest to the highest. And I can sort from by difficulty as well. For these numerical ones, if I click a second time, then it will sort in the opposite direction. So now it's going from the highest to the lowest instead of lowest to the highest. I like to start by looking at the discrimination. So I'm going to sort again lowest discrimination to the highest. And I'm going to also point out to you these red dots over here at the far left are an indication of questions that Blackboard feels need your review. Now again, these are all recommendations. They're all suggestions for you. So you can feel free to ignore Blackboard's recommendation. However, these are the questions based on a combination of discrimination and difficulty that Blackboard thinks might need some uh, consideration. This first one particularly concerns me. I have a discrimination of negative 0.65. And that's, that's really quite terrible, actually. That probably means that there's something wrong with the question. So when I want to look at this in more detail, I can click on the text of the question over to the left. And I will get a new page with just that question. So here, I have some details about that question. For example, the um, discrimination, the difficulty, all of those statistics that came from that first view, as well as I actually get a table of the results from each, uh, each of the options, as well as the top 25, the, the quartiles of student achievement. So this top 25% are the students who scored in the top 25% on the test overall, and how they answered on this question. So actually, when I look at this, the question is, instructors can embed a YouTube video to a Blackboard course using the mashup feature. The answer should be true. This is a true statement, but it's marked false. So that's why this one's a problem. The students who did poorly on the exam got this question wrong. Uh, which is why the discrimination is flipped. And the reason it's flipped is because the students who were doing well got the question right, but I marked it wrong. To fix this, I'm going to click the Edit Test button over here to the right and actually go back to the test canvas. So this is a test canvas where you set up your uh, test questions in the first place. And here's that first question that was having some issues. Instructors can embed a YouTube video. What I can do is actually edit this question. Before I go in and edit, I want to point out that Blackboard is trying to give you as much information as possible. So this orange bar at the top says, this test has 20 attempts. That means that this has already been taken and alerts me to the fact that when I make an edit, that's going to affect those attempts. It's, it's acceptable, it's fine for you to do so, but make sure before you do this that you've thought through the ramifications and that you communicate what you've done to your students. So I'm going to edit this question and change the correct answer here in section three, answer from false to true. Then I will submit an update. Blackboard prompts me that this will require regrading and do I want to continue? I'll say OK. And then gets me uh, another bar that tells me the status is complete on regrading all of those attempts. That's great. That means that now that should be updated for all of the, the student attempts. I'm going to go back to the item analysis so we can look at more of these questions. I'm going to actually go back to tests using the breadcrumb and access the item analysis for that Blackboard NG review. Again, having that, those multiple workflows of where you can get to this really helps out in this case. Now, the timestamp has stayed the same. This report has not changed. 
So the discrimination for that first question is still a negative 0.65. If I want to see it updated, I'll need to run the analysis again. And I'll do that in a moment, but let's look at a few more of these. So the second question, um, Blackboard says it's fine. So that's good. This discrimination is a little low, but the difficulty rating is pretty high, meaning that it was a fairly easy question. So I'm, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to look next at this which tools in Blackboard, this one that Blackboard flagged for me. It was a multiple answer with a fairly decent discrimination. However, um, only 21% of students got this question correct. That's a really, a really poor difficulty score, unless this is a really hard question. So I'm going to take a look at this one. OK, I think I know what the problem is here. This one is a multiple answer. So these two questions, both of these, would need to be selected to be marked as a correct response. Most of my students selected one of the two correct answers. But it looks like most of them didn't select both. And I'm making that judgment based on the fact that five selected the assignment tool, but three selected SafeAssign. So so they wouldn't have gotten that question correct. They would have to have marked both of those. And that's pretty well stated here in the average score as well. So I'm going to go back and edit this question to allow partial credit. I think that will make a big difference on that difficulty. And the average score should go up. So let's edit that question. That one was, let's see, if I think it's all the way here at the bottom, which tools allow electronic submission, this one. So let me edit this question. And I'm going to change my options to allow partial credit. Once I've done that, now I'll need to change the partial credit percentages. But since there are two correct answers and the partial credit percentages are 50, I'm, I'm good with that. If you select one, you'll get five out of 10 points. And if you select both, then you'll get 10 out of 10. I think that's a good approach. So I'm going to submit and update this. Again, Blackboard asked for a confirmation and has been queued and completed. So now that we've made two changes, I'm going to go back to test surveys and pools to that test. And I'm going to go to the item analysis again. This time, I'm going to run the item analysis so I get a fresh report. Because I want to see how making those two changes has modified the results. So I'm going to run for Blackboard NG review. Looks like the analysis is complete. So I can click on the link and view. Oh, and I got my email. Thank you for email update that the analysis is run. Well, that's actually a much better score. So it's gone from a 58 to a 65 for the average score. And now the, um, the YouTube question is down here at the bottom. It has a very strong discrimination. It's moved to being a medium question now instead of a hard question. And I don't have a red dot anymore to recommend review. However, I do have now a yellow triangle. And that's an indication, according to legend here at the bottom, that the question might have changed after it was deployed. Pardon me. And what that means is that when I made the change to change the correct answer, now this question has been modified. And Blackboard just wants to draw that to our attention. And I can also look at the other question I modified, which tools in Blackboard allow electronic submission. And that one now has a, a better difficulty rating. Instead of 21%, now I have a 57.9%. Uh, and students, the average has gone up to over 5. So this is, a, this is better for my students. They have a higher average score, both because I changed the, correct, the question here at the bottom that was incorrect. Uh, incorrectly marked by me, and I allowed partial credit for the second question. Uh, let me look at this other question here. Students can check their grade. This one needs to be remarked as well. Uh, notice I have a 26% difficulty. So most of the students got this question wrong. 
Let me look at it too. You know, this is probably the same problem. I think it's because it's a multiple answer and they wouldn't have selected all of them. I could change this one to allow partial credit. However, I also think that some of this is a bit misleading because the majority of students would do this last one. They're just going to go to my grades. And I can see that that's where most of the students have marked their answers are for that last option. So I could allow partial credit, but to me, I think it's probably just a poor question. It seems kind of misleading. So I'm going to edit the test. And this time, instead of changing the partial credit, I'm going to, I think, I'm going to consider how it's graded overall. Instead of editing the question, here's that students can check their grade from, from where. I'm going to click over here by points. This question's worth 10 points. And I have some options. I could update how many points it's worth. So for example, if I had a question that turned out to be really, really hard, I could make it only worth one point. So it's relatively worth less compared to the, the other questions. Uh, that would penalize students less for getting it wrong. I could mark this one as extra credit. That would take my, question, my test that's worth 100 points and take out those 10, so now it's only worth 90. Those students who got the question correct would get 10 points extra credit, um, so their scores wouldn't change, the, the ones who got it correct, and the ones who got it wrong, it would now be out of 90, so their, their percentage would go up. The other option I have is to award full credit. This essentially says, it was a bad question, I'm going to just give everyone credit for the question. So that's how I'm going to mark it this time. I'm going to award full credit to everyone because it was my mistake, it was a bad question, so now everyone gets the 10 points. So I'll submit and regrade and click OK. So now waiting, OK, complete for regrading that. And I can go back and run the item analysis one more time to see how that impacted it. So we run a new one because the old one wouldn't show the updated grading. So now for that one, 100% uh, because students all got it correct. There's again my email reminder that the review was complete or the, the analysis ran. So now the average score for that question is a 10 because everyone got it correct. But the discrimination has moved to cannot calculate because Everyone got it right, so there, there is no discrimination, no differentiation in responses based on how students did on the exam overall. And then if you notice as well, the average score has gone up even a, yet further, so now the average is a 72. So I've changed three questions because they were, one was incorrectly marked, one uh, didn't allow partial credit, I modified that, and this last one I deemed to be a really just a poor question. So instead of modifying the question, I gave everyone credit for, for the question, free 10 points. Um, right now, those are the three ways that you can um, offer, that you can modify the test. I'm going to switch back now to um, the slides. Just a moment while that adjusts. For my, my last few points on using item analysis. So this is just a tool. It's available as a, an added bonus to you if you use the Blackboard tests. Uh, if you use the Scantrons here at NIU processed through assessment through testing services, they do provide you with a discrimination and a difficulty rating on the report you get back. So essentially now, if you've used Scantrons in the past, you can get those same results now using the item analysis in Blackboard, which I think is a great bonus. When you use this information, I think there are two different ways you can use it. One is sort of a, a formative feedback, one's a summative feedback. This semester, the item, the item analysis will help you find questions that your students struggled with, those that they found to be difficult, which in turn, lets you address that content again in class to try to clear up those misunderstandings. 
It's a learning opportunity for your students to realize what they got wrong and what they could do better the next time. It's also an opportunity for you to find questions that may have been problematic, whether they were misleading, whether they were um, incorrectly marked, or um, had other, other issues. And it gives you the tools to be able to make those decisions and adjust the way that the test is graded if necessary. It may not be necessary. You may find that there is a low difficulty percentage, so it's a hard question, and that's OK because you intended it to be a hard question. That's fine. However, if you thought it was an easy question and a lot of students got it wrong, that may be a misleading question or a, a misunderstanding that they have. And the item analysis gives you the ability to find those a little bit easier. From one semester to the next, uh, what this will let you do as well is look at the difficulty of your questions and maybe adjust accordingly. If this semester you found that your test was really a lot harder than you intended it to be, you had a lot of hard questions and not so many easy or medium ones, then you can go back and for the next semester maybe revisit some of those questions and take some of the harder ones and replace them with easier ones or vice versa. If you found that your test was really all easy questions, you can change some of them to make them a little bit harder. Because the, the goal of the test is not to trick students, but it is to give them the chance to really show what they know and to show that they know it in depth and in detail. You can also reconsider some questions that may be poor discriminators. If it's a question that everyone got right, that may or may not fit with your goals for the test and your goals for that question. I would, if you have a negative discrimination, I would address that this semester. But then I would make sure that that carried over to the next semester. So if it was a misconception that they had in class, reconsider asking that question or reconsider the way that you address that material in order to better prepare students for the question the next semester. I encourage, if you have any ideas, other ideas on how you might use the item analysis, put those in the text chat, and I'll be glad to include those the next time I offer this workshop. So as a reminder, for more information on this or any tool in Blackboard, our Teaching with Blackboard site is at niu.edu slash blackboard. And all of the information about assessment tools and about tests and surveys are under assessing learners. The item analysis in particular is under assessing learners and then under tests and surveys. So you'll have to do kind of a double click to find the item analysis. But it's there as part of our documentation on tests and surveys. Again, my name is Stephanie Richter. I'll hang on here for a few minutes. I think I have one more question to address for Bill. But if you need to reach out with further questions later, feel free to send me an email or contact me on Twitter. I'm more than happy to answer those. So for those of you here, if you have more questions, type them in the text chat. And in the meantime, Bill, you had asked the question about uh, students using the formatting tools. I think you mean the, the content editor. And you ask, is there student orientation for using the Blackboard tools? There is, there is not any student training specifically for using the Blackboard tools. We do have a website within the Teaching with Blackboard site. We do have some documentation for students on using Blackboard. Let me put that link here into the, the text chat for those of you who are watching live. Otherwise, it's on at that niu.edu slash Blackboard. Let me come back here the section labeled for students. This has documentation on several different aspects of using Blackboard. It does not specifically have documentation on using the content editor. So if there's an advanced application, for example, if you want students to use the math editor, I would provide them with some um, guidance on how to access that and how to use it. Because every, every course is going to use those tools differently. But this for students is a great resource for finding some of that information initially. All right, if there are no other questions right now, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you so much, those of you who are in the archive, for joining us.